Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us today at this Discover Economics Careers event as part of Careers Week. Today, we have an exciting lineup of economists that have come to talk to us today. I feel like I'm at one of those concerts where you see like, you know, an exciting lineup of, um, of, of musicians. Uh, we have people from the public sector, the private sector, tech um, and research as well. So I'm, I'm David, I'm gonna be your host for today. Um, I'm just gonna give a brief introduction into, into myself and then um, we'll go into the different panelists. I'll try and be very quick. Um, and please, as well as we go on throughout the evening, please use the chat box, ask any questions that you might have. Um, I think we're also going to have polls at some points um, during this, um, this event. So please engage with us and please feel free to just ask any questions and we'll try our best to answer them as we go along. All right, so hi everyone again, good evening. Thank you for sparing your time today. Uh, my name is David, as I mentioned, and I'm the host for, for this event. Um, I'm currently studying a master's in research and economics at the University of Bristol. Um, I kind of started my economic journey at Bristol seven years ago when I did my undergraduate. Um, after graduating there, I went off to LSC to study a master's, and then I worked at the UK government for two years. And after that, I worked as the editor-in-chief of Steers Business, which is a media publication in Nigeria. It just means I was, a, I was, I was running a team of journalists who were writing economic articles on the Nigerian economy. Um, I guess, so I'm now come full circle. I'm back in university again. I just loved it that much. Um, and now I am looking to start a PhD uh, later this year. I guess just to quickly talk about what economics means to me in, in, in two minutes, because um, I want us to, to, to get into the meat of today's event. I kind of, when I started at university, I had this, there was this like consensus or this general theme that economics was basically about money or finance or account. If I, if I told anyone I studied economics, they might ask me to do their accounting homework for them or the, you know, tell them how to make money. I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's not what economics is about for me. Um, but while there are huge aspects of economics that, you know, there are aspects of economics that do talk about money and I'm happy we have, you know, Doobie who's from Goldman Sachs to give us some ex exciting insights into that. Economics as a whole has more to it than just the money. Um, when, when I am at events like this, I like to push the agenda that economics is about people. Um, it's about how people make decisions you know, firms, businesses, countries as a whole, how they interact, um, how we fix problems in society. It's about understanding the different problems we have and how do we fix them. So for me, economics is about people and trying to improve the welfare or improve, you know, the happiness or improve society. And that is why it's important to have diversity of thoughts in, in the economic profession because ultimately there are a diverse range of people in, in the world. And so in economics, which is trying to influence how we solve our problems, we need to make sure that we have a diverse range of people you know, in the profession trying to solve our, our different problems. So for me, that's economics. I'm sure that you know, as we go throughout the panel, this, the theme of economics has been about people and different agents in the world will surely come up regardless of which panel we are, we are on. All right, so let's get straight to it. Um, we have, like I said, the public sector, people from the public sector here, the private sector, research and tech, and we're gonna kick off with the public sector. So I think what I would do is I would get each person to introduce themselves, um, tell us what their role is and what they find most exciting about what they do. And then, you know, if we have time, we'll ask more questions within you know, that, that particular panel. So let's start off with the public sector and I'll kick off with Sylvia, please. Many thanks. So uh, hi everyone, I am Sylvia Brumana and I work as an assistant economist at the Competition and Markets Authority. So uh, as an economist at the Competition Authority, basically I can work on mergers and acquisitions between firms on antitrust, so violations of competition law or in broad terms, uh, when firms misbehave, and uh, also projects uh, uh, regarding uh, consumer detriment. Uh, across these projects, uh, the type of tasks uh, that you do every day are first uh, uh, collect uh, information from companies uh, or also from uh, consumers' associations, 
And then uh, we have to uh, analyze this uh, evidence and uh, um, try to understand the market we're working on. And we discuss a lot with our colleagues in the team. Uh, these analysis could also be quantitative, so with data, etc. And then uh, we often have calls uh, with companies. Uh, and uh, after uh, these, uh, so when we understand uh, how the situation is in the market and we come to a conclusion, a decision, we draft uh, our report uh, and we can also give uh, presentations. In my uh, job, I mainly work with economists, uh, but I can also work with the legal uh, or the finance team. Uh, what I mostly enjoy about my work is uh, first, uh, as uh, in the public sector, we serve the public. So um, I, I, feel, I really feel that uh, what we're doing uh, I mean, the objective of what we're doing is really to try to improve the welfare of consumers, of people in society, to, to try to, let's say, with the objective to um, that consumers get uh, high quality products and services and also uh, are not exploited with uh, high prices. Uh, as a competition economist, uh, I work on a variety of sectors. So uh, there is um, uh, every project uh, I start uh, is always in a different sector, and this is uh, very exciting. And uh, yes, uh, a minor point is that uh, I enjoy quantitative work. So as an economist, you do it a lot. <laughs> that is all uh, from me. And we have Rachel. Hello, very nice to meet you all. My name is Rachel Rosen and I'm an Assistant Director of Economics and Strategic Analysis at NHS England. Um, so I work in our Economics and Strategic Analysis team, which sits within our broader kind of data and analytics directorate. Um, NHS England, for those of you who don't know, is an arm's length body that's responsible for leading the NHS in England, setting policy along with the Department of Health and Social Care, um, making kind of operational decisions and doing planning for the health service. Um, so in terms of what I do in my role specifically on a day to day basis, I identify design and lead high priority economic analysis projects on major NHS priorities. So over the past several years that I've worked in this role, um, I've had the opportunity to work on a lot of really different, um, really diverse areas for the health service. Recently, I've been doing a lot on the COVID response. So trying to forecast what COVID demand will be, um, help improve vaccination rates, um, and uh, work on long COVID clinics as well. I've also had the opportunity in the past to work on mental health services, improving the quality of mental health care, um, to look at why people wait a long time for urgent and emergency care, and really just contribute to a lot of different issues of NHS operational performance. Um, I also line manage and project manage a number of other kind of economists and people from other professional backgrounds. So I had the opportunity to contribute to a lot of people's professional development. Um, and in terms of who I work with from kind of non-analytical backgrounds, I work a lot with other NHS, NHS staff. So I work with doctors, nurses, um, people from non-clinical backgrounds in the NHS. Um, and we also sometimes have the opportunity to work with patient representatives, which is really exciting. Um, as far as what I what I like about my job, it's really similar. So I'm really proud to work for the NHS. I'm really proud to be able to help um, people in the UK and in England specifically to have better health services, to help the people who work for the NHS to do things more effectively and have better working conditions. And I also really like that I get to work on a lot of very challenging intellectual problems. I get to use all the skills that I learned in my studies um, to make a difference every day. And uh, no two days are exactly the same. I get to work on a lot of really different questions. Thank you, Rachel. I guess I'll, I'll stick to you first since, since we're here discussing. Um, so I saw a stat that the NHS recruits is some, I, it's either the most economists or at least a very, very high number of economists in the UK. And I guess my question is why, why is it important for the NHS to have economists working? And because, and, I mean, to someone, it might seem a bit weird that, oh, you know, why, you know, and the NHS obviously recruits doctors and nurses, but, but why, why do you have economists working at the NHS as well? I guess one thing to say is just that the NHS is actually one of the largest employers in the world. Um, so we hire a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds, um, not just economists, but for economists specifically. Um, 
it's I think it's a really, really important skill set for the NHS. So for me, economics is all about um, understanding how to allocate resources, how to use uh, scarce resources effectively, understanding how people make decisions and respond to incentives. Um, and I think all of that is exactly the kind of thing that goes into um, understanding how to make a public health service run effectively. Um, so it's really, really relevant to everything I do on a day to day basis and everything that happens on a day to day basis in the NHS. Um, economics also just gives you a lot of, of kind of skills and tools to unpick complex problems and to think about complex systems and how they work together. So not everything I do is a pure economics project, like forecasting COVID demand isn't necessarily a pure economics project, but I'm able to use the skills and the techniques that I've learned and also just the logical frameworks that I've learned as an economist to think about those really challenging problems. Yeah, that's great to hear. I, I love that point, especially about economists being trained to solve problems. So like you said, a lot of times, you know, sometimes economists are not actually doing econ specific work, but just the ability to solve problems is a very good skill that you pick up as an economist. So thanks for that. Uh, Sylvia, I'll come back to you. Um, question, you mentioned that, you know, I guess one of the main things you do is work in M&A, so mergers and acquisitions. So I guess just to give more, more of a broad insight into that. So if a company wants to merge with another company, um, you guys would look into that. Or if one company wants to acquire another company, you guys would look into that. Why is it important for the government or the NHS, or the NHS, the government to have oversight over that? In terms of, I'm thinking of from an everyday person, why, why is it important for you know, us to be looking into, into merging and acquisition in terms of how that might impact the everyday person on the street? Yes, um, definitely. So um, basically, when to think of a market, so um, a market uh, is basically the set of products uh, uh, supplied by the firms that want to merge. So think, for instance, of a pharmaceutical drug. And uh, uh, in this market, uh, there can be very few firms, uh, say, for instance, three or four. Uh, after the merger, of course, uh, or after the acquisition, uh, the number of firms would decrease. And this means that the number of firms supplying that specific pharmaceutical drugs decreases. And if consumers do not have many alternatives, maybe those firms, since they are few, can, for instance, collude so they can agree with each other to increase the price of that pharmaceutical drug. And since cons uh, in order to make more profits. Uh, and since consumers uh, would not, not have an alternative to switch to, they would have to pay that price. And uh, I worked, for instance, on cases of excessive pricing. So where the companies really charge very high prices uh, on uh, pharmaceutical drugs that were really uh, necessary for people to, uh, to um, sorry, to other, um, cure uh, very uh, severe diseases. And uh, people had to pay those uh, very high prices just, uh, let's say, to, to stay healthy or to take care of themselves. And this is really unfair. And the competition authority, you know, is there to, to, to check whether mergers can lead uh, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, sorry, can lead to market power for firms uh, or to check uh, in cases of excessive pricing, whether the company is uh, selling, uh, for instance, a specific pharmaceutical drug uh, is charging a price uh, that is not explained uh, by the cost uh, that it has uh, in order to produce the drug. So yes, um, I hope um, I explained it uh, well. <laughs> yeah, no, very, 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 very well explained. I actually have a recent example just last week in Nigeria, um, the four main um, airline companies colluded and increased prices by 100%. And so because you know, the country doesn't have a very strong um, competitions authority, you know, there hasn't been much pushback. So that's the kind of example where you need you know, a competition authority to be like, hang on, you, know, you can't just increase prices by 100%. That's very bad for the consumer. Is that reflected in the cost of actually running airlines? So very important to have in any country and economy. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, I guess to, to both Rachel and Sylvia, there are quite a few questions about um, qualifications needed to work at, 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 to be an economist, but I guess you guys can also answer from, from the perspective of the public sector. Um, so yeah, I guess the floor is open. 
So I wrote something in the chat, but just to ensure everyone kind of hears, I'll, I'll say that, so I personally have a master's degree and an undergrad degree in economics, um, but I don't have a PhD. My team uh, tends to hire people with a mix of academic qualifications and practical uh, experience. And especially recently, we've been expanding apprenticeship routes into our organization as well. Um, and I think Sam has put a link in the chat to more information about the government economic service uh, degree apprenticeship scheme. So there are quite a few different routes and different types of qualifications that people have. Yes, I totally agree with uh, Rachel. <laughs> I wanted also to mention the apprentice, uh, apprenticeship uh, route. Um, personally, yes, I joined the CMA uh, as an intern, so with uh, an internship. Um, I also have a master's degree, but uh, in order to um, get access to an internship at the CMA, you can also have uh, just a bachelor or be in your penultimate year of your undergraduate degree. And uh, um, yes, uh, um, there are, I currently have, for instance, various colleagues that uh, are on an apprenticeship scheme. So they are um, at the same time working with us, with us and studying. So this is definitely another feasible route to do. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys. Okay, um, question. I think for me, I really like events like this because when I was 16 or even up until when I got to university, I didn't have this breadth of, I didn't know that these different roles in economics existed, um, which I, this is why I think this is great. So shout out to Discover Economics there. But I guess, what would you guys have done differently if you were 16 or what would you tell your 16 year old self um, if, if, you know, time went back? Um, you know, how would you think, do things differently or, or what would you tell yourself back then? Um, who wants to go first? I can see Rachel smiling. Is, I'm going to go with you, Rachel. <laughs> sure. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy with how my career turned out, so I wouldn't do too much differently. But I guess um, in terms of what I'm, what I'm happy with and what I would advise to others, um, I would definitely recommend doing exactly what you're all doing now at this event. So finding out more about the practical applications of careers you're considering. I would totally recommend economics, but any, any others that you're thinking about, I think what took me a while to know that I wanted to go into economics was not understanding exactly what it would look like to work in the field. So I didn't know anyone who was an economist. Um, my perception of it was either very much like finance or academia. Um, and I just, I didn't have a sense of whether I would be able to sort of do like very practical things. I've always been interested in like maths and stats, but I wanted a career where I would be practically applying them. Um, and I think when I was able to find out more about the different types of economics, so my master's degree is actually in health economics, and that's obviously what I'm working in now. When I was able to find out about that field, it became really clear to me like what I would be able to do and how my career would have an impact. Um, and the last thing I would just say is that, like this isn't maybe advice, but um, I think it's important to know that economics is super versatile and isn't really, really in demand from a lot of different types of employers. Like you'll definitely get a sense of that tonight. Um, so just understanding the many different ways that you can have a, a successful career as an economist, I think is, is really important. Thank you. Yes, I totally agree with Rachel. Um, as mentioned, uh, as she mentioned, uh, uh, economics is a very wide field uh, with different subfields. So uh, I would uh, first of all in encourage uh, students to maybe read uh, articles on economics. Um, there are many online newspapers. It is true that there are paywalls, but many can be accessed uh, for free and get a flavor of the field of economics that they would be mostly be interested about. Uh, also, maybe. Um, I thought that uh, many online courses of economics are, are free. Maybe you could just uh, enroll for one of them in order to try to get a flavor of what it, would, it could be like to study economics. Uh, and then uh, also get in touch uh, with uh, students of economics. Many universities uh, have, for instance, a website when, uh, where you can find the comments for former students and you can reach out to them via social networks. Uh, for instance, I was reached out by many uh, people that were interested in the university attended. And uh, another thing could be to sign up for newsletters, uh, advertising uh, job vacancies for economists, you know, just to get a flavor of what is the, the demand out there, what are the roles uh, uh, for economists that are highly demanded, what are the requirements, the, the skills that are demanded. 
and uh, and yes, so, so is. Thank you. Very great advice, guys. I've seen a question on um, international um, students working at the public sector. So I can take this because I also worked at the public sector um, for a bit. So it's, it, it varies. So some roles, I think they have to be like very related to like defense or some roles in the foreign, in the, in the foreign office are UK national specific. But on the whole, especially the roles you apply to directly, um, international students can apply, especially if your country is in the Commonwealth, um, which, is, which, is, which, is, which is a long list of countries. Um, so yeah, I, I know there are a few specific roles. I'm not sure about the, the fast stream, the civil service. I'm not sure about the civil service fast stream, which is kind of the, one of the main routes to get into the, the, um, the civil service. For economists as well, but I do know that if you go on to like civil service jobs, you, you know international international applicants are are mostly fine with with getting in. I don't know if Sylvia and Rachel have any other insights on that. Yeah, from an NHS perspective, I'll just say that we're actually not technically part of the civil service, and we do we do sponsor. Um, we are one of the employers that can sponsor visas. Um, this isn't like a public sector specific thing, but there is a list of the employers who are registered sponsors. So if you're not sure about whether you'd be able to be sponsored for a specific job you're looking at, you can check there. Um, but we we have, I'm not originally from the UK, although I'm a British citizen, um, and we do have a lot like a lot of international people working in our team and our organization and in the NHS in general. Yes, and uh, same for instance at the, at the competition authority, we have many international uh, um, colleagues. Um, especially from the Commonwealth, for instance. And uh, yes, also the CMA at the moment uh, is not uh, a visa sponsor. Thank you, guys. OK, so I guess final questions. Let's bring it back to the specifics of, of working in the public sector. I don't know how many of you engage with like uh, maybe policy or even politicians. Um, I guess, how have you guys found the relationship or the dynamic between working as an economist with, I guess, other people from other professions like policy or even politicians? How have you guys found that dynamic? I haven't worked with politicians. <laughs> uh, so uh, the CMA is, uh, let's say, a political. So um, we, uh, we work uh, on projects uh, that can help the government. So whatever the uh, political side uh, is at the government. But of course, uh, inside the CMA, there are many professions, uh, as you said, like a policy, or as I, as I said uh, before, uh, le the legal team or the, the finance team. Um, I think that uh, working with different professions is uh, really eye-opening because uh, you really don't work uh, only with the economic eye, so the uh, eye of an economist, but uh, uh, what you uh, what you bring to the table is integrated by other by other fields like law or finance, and I think that this is deeply enriching. <laughs> yeah, so I think um, we're probably quite similar in that you know, we're not, we're not a government department, so we don't work directly with ministers or politicians per se, um, but we do work with policymakers and we do, um, some of the policymakers we work with do work directly with ministers. So for instance, in the past um, couple of years, I've been working with the national incident directors for the COVID response for the NHS, and they obviously do have to take our analysis and use that in their discussions with the Department of Health, with cabinet office, um, with, with politicians. Um, I have found it to be really interesting and exciting. I think um, generally my reflection is that our analysis and the skills of economists are really valued by the policy colleagues that we work with. Um, I think they really appreciate all of the skills that we've talked about to kind of structure problems in a logical way, give really clear answers. I think we've seen some comments in the chat about the mix of skills that economists have. So we're not purely maths or purely kind of communications and writing. And I think that balance of skills serves us really well when we're working with policymakers, politicians, um, people from a range of professional backgrounds. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think the public sector is one of the places where you find that you have to use a mix of those skills because as important as your analytical work is, if you're not able to communicate that properly to, you know, like policy colleagues, you know, then you have a problem. So you're right, you know, being able to do both sides of the coin is very important. 
Solid. Thank you very much, Rachel and Sylvia. Uh, any last comments before we move on? Cool. Thank you, guys. Uh, we'll move on now to our next uh, panel, the private sector. And we have a few more speakers on there. Um, I know we have uh, Doobie. Um, we've got Georgia, Fiona, and Grace. So let's kick things off. Similar questions. Um, tell us your role um, and what you enjoy most about the job that you do as well. So let's kick off with Doobie. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Doobie. Uh, I work at Goldman Sachs as an electronic trader. Um, I've been at Goldman for about two years now. Um, so for those of you that don't know what Goldman Sachs is, it is an investment bank. Um, and in my specific role in electronic trading, our role is basically um, managing a platform which enables big businesses, so like pension funds, hedge funds, um, to be able to basically trade um, and access certain stock exchanges like London Stock Exchange and their uh, Belgium Stock Exchange, whatever it might be. Um, similar to how you guys might be able to use something like Trading 212 at home, but um, for these kind of larger investors, they need um, a platform that is you know, quite a bit more robust because they're trading like significantly more every single day. Um, so in terms of my day-to-day, -day, uh, my day-to-day -day is full of answering client questions about our platform, managing um, incoming trades every single day, um, which vary in volume depending on what's going on in the markets. Um, it is helping our like tech team and our development team to make changes and create new products based on what our clients need. Um, and yeah, that's, that's uh, and just analyzing how we're doing day to day basically. Nice, thank you very much, Ruby. Uh, Priyanka, I'm so sorry I, I, I skipped your name. Um, it's not because I don't like you. That's just my bad. Um, you can go second. Please tell us what you do and what you enjoy about your, your role. Yes, David, just wanted to check if I, if I got that wrong. Uh, but uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, and I, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Priyanka Rojo 3 and I work as a consultant uh, in an economic consulting firm called Frontier Economics. Um, a brief background about who, what the firm does. So a Frontier Economics is a microeconomics consulting firm. Uh, we work across various industries uh, such as energy, water, uh, and also uh, across different practices. And that includes uh, working on issues of competition, regulation, strategy, as well as policy. Um, as a consultant in the forum, I focus on strategy and policy areas, um, and that is where I am uh, working on currently. Um, my background is I have done both my bachelor's and my master's in um, economics. I studied at LSE for my master's, but uh, prior to that, I was in India, so I moved here for my master's, so happy to answer questions if anyone has anything on those lines. Um, and in general, I guess what I do in my role is the main difference is uh, if you if you are working in frontier economics, uh, you get to focus on microeconomics problems, which is working on issues of individual choices, decisions, how businesses take decisions, rather than the general view of the market, such as inflation or GDP growth and employment. So that is, I think, one of the key differences of, of, of what a microeconomics consulting firm does. Um, and on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, as I said, I work on strategic and policy issues, but this might be for businesses who have who come to us to understand the competition aspects of their work, the commercial aspects of their work, um, and in the policy practice, of course, uh, the government and policy uh, makers coming to us for different economic analysis. Um, I'll stop there uh, and maybe leave the rest for further questions, if that's all right. Thank you very much, Priyanka. And then we have Georgia. Hi, everyone. I'm Drew Davis, and I'm a consultant at Oxira. Um, by way of background, Oxira is also a microeconomic consultancy, um, so similar to Frontier in that respect. Um, and it also, it also involves finance as well. 
um, but essentially we bring together our economics and finance skills and apply them to real world settings. Um, so here we advise clients on a range of issues and our clients can include governments, companies and regulators. Um, I've been at the company since graduating from university and actually started out as an intern um, and I can speak a bit about that journey um, later if people have specific questions in relation to that. Um, but as a consultancy, you know, clients come to us with economic related issues. Um, I personally work on issues related to competition and regulation, and I work across a range of projects as well. So I get a lot of experience from different, of different sectors, which is really interesting and it provides a very, um, yeah, a good mix of, a good mix of projects and a good mix of sectors. Um, so as part of my role, it's I, I listen to the issues of different clients um, and work alongside my, my colleagues and clients to find solutions using economic principles. Um, so day to day, this involves like doing guest based research, doing some analysis, writing reports and speaking to clients. Um, in terms of uh, what I enjoy most about my work, so I enjoy seeing how economics comes into so many aspects of, of you know, real world life. Um, and what I also enjoy is being able to communicate and talk about this, because I think oftentimes economics can be wrapped up in lots of jargon, which makes it quite, um, which doesn't make it very accessible, but this need not be the case. So those are the aspects that I enjoy about it. Thank you very much. And then we have the KPMG duos, uh, Fiona and Grace. Uh, Hi. Grace, yourself. Hi, I'm Grace Power. Um, I'm an economic analyst at KPMG. Um, me and Fiona actually work in the same team. So um, we're probably, <laughs> probably best to do this together. So we work for the um, economic policy and appraisal team within the wider economics department. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, KPMG is a consultancy company who's, who's normally specialised in tax and audit. So it, the economics team is fairly new, I think. It's, it was formed in the last 10 to 15 years. So we're still building, we're still very much growing. Um, we've grown quite a lot in the last few years, actually. Um, Fiona being a new addition to the team. Um, so where I started, I personally didn't have an economics background. I did economics at A-level, loved it, but I went on to do a maths degree. Um, and then later in life, I decided I actually wanted to go back to doing economics. So I am now studying economics in my evenings and uh, whilst working in economics. So if anyone wants to ask me any questions, if they want to go into something else or that they don't necessarily have the economics background, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions there. Um, I've been at KPMG for five years. I've worked in a variety of roles. I was a, I came in as a PA, um, so completely different to <laughs> being an economist. And then I went into tax. Um, but all of them roles have really helped me in my current role. I think it's being able to speak to people, uh, understanding what people are saying is a key, key skill for this role. Uh, and I, I, I think it was... Georgia, like cutting down the jargon. Some there's there's a lot of jargon in economics, and um, a lot of the time it's just just trying to understand what it actually means. It's, it's I think is key to the role. Um, yeah, I, I'll pass on to Fiona because I'm hogging our spot. Yeah, hi everyone. I think that was that was well said, Grace. Absolutely. In terms of what KPMG does, I'm assistant manager in the economics team with Grace in economics uh, policy and appraisal. So, as the name suggests, we do a lot of work in that respect. Quite a lot of our day to day is looking at um, impact assessment, evaluation projects. So it could be for the private sector or the public sector, and maybe an organisation would want to know what its impact is if they're going to make a big investment. You know, what what kind of impact is going to have? Um, and as David said right up front, it's it's not just about the sort of financial impacts. Actually, a lot of what we do, it's it's much broader than that it's a socio-economic impact what impact is this going to have on people's life um, and so we get to use all of the different tools quantitative and qualitative to, to get to the bottom of some of those issues and I think actually in terms of what I enjoy most about the role it's probably that that 
And the day is very varied. It can be cut across a number of sectors, but it's the different skills that you get to use. So perhaps you're really into math, really quantitative, and there's definitely a place for those skills. But maybe actually you like reading, you like writing, and, and that's more your thing. So you could do a lot of desk research and lit review. So there's no one element of economics. It's, it's actually very all encompassing. I think that's maybe one of the misconceptions. I don't have a maths A-level, for instance, but I went on to get a PhD in economics. So there are lots of different routes into, into doing this. Um, and there's certainly no one, not one size fits all. Grace and I have very different backgrounds and we're here working in the same team. So it's, it's very accessible, very open um, and a lot of fun really to solve all, all different sorts of problems actually using different skills. So that's very much what I uh, enjoy most uh, about the role. It's the, the breadth um, and it can, can be some good fun. Thank you very much for that, Fiona. I, I love that. Uh, okay, I guess if we look at the difference between working at the public sector versus the private sector, um, what's it like working for clients? Like, what's that, what's that like working for another like private sector um, institution that has, I guess, you know, specific objectives that they have paid for? You know, that's, I guess, you know, and, and they're trying to reach certain objectives. What's it like work, working with, with, with private sector clients? And if you do have the most exciting clients you've worked with, not, not necessarily name, but most exciting project you've worked on and why that excited you. If, if you, any of you guys have, have that, please also give that after, after the answer. But the first question is, is what's it like working, working with clients? I guess, Fiona, you can kick us off. Yeah, sure, happy to. I think um, for me, one of the things I enjoy most about it, one of the most exciting things is that it's very challenging, for sure. You can definitely get a lot of complex requests um, and a lot of sort of big ideas, and it's finding ways to uh, to, to achieve what the client is asking for, using the resources that you've got and doing so using the right tools and the right skills. I think it's always about communication, being clear uh, on, on what you can do and the best way to go about it and to, to really listen. I think that's a very big part of communication is actually sitting back and, and listening to what's being said and finding an innovative way of doing it, maybe drawing on lots of different methodologies. And that's why it's quite nice to work as part of a team where we all bring different things to the table to try and find these sort of clever ways to, to solve the problems. So it, it can definitely be challenging, but enormously rewarding. And um, my, my biggest tip would be to listen carefully um, and to find an, an innovative way of going about it. Um, and I, I don't know about uh, whether or not uh, this is relevant in terms of an example, but one, maybe using the, my PhD as, as, as the context for this. Um, it was sponsored by Siemens Gamesa and it was looking at the impact of the development of um, a, a, new, a new blade factory for the, the manufacture of blades for offshore wind turbines. Um, and it was a lot of fun working for, for those guys and, and trying to understand the economic impact of that as a development in uh, an economy that I'm very familiar with in the north of England. Um, and it was, it was great to work alongside them and to find new ways to, to do things to, to address their, their needs. Thank you very much. Uh, Georgia or Priyanka, any of you have an answer? Yeah, sure. Just to, just to echo what's been said, you know, it can, it's, it's really interesting, but of course it does have its challenges working, um, working with, with private clients for the point that you raised it in the sense that you know, they're hiring us to deliver a piece of work and they may expect a certain outcome. But I think the importance of um, delivering those services to them is to be impartial and to you know work with integrity so the messages that you know you deliver aren't necessarily always what they want to hear but actually you know when using your economics toolkit this is the results that are, are um, that the analysis shows so I think in that sense it can be challenging but at the same time I think clients definitely appreciate appreciate it when your work comes from a background of integrity and relying on the evidence. Yeah, I think just to add to that, not much because I agree with both what Fiona and Georgia mentioned, uh, but I think one aspect to keep in mind is to understand why clients come to us. Um, and as Georgia mentioned, they, they want an objective evidence-based assessment work to be provided to them. So they come to us with problems or to support them in whatever aspect they do need support in. But if they could or wanted us like an outcome that they already had in mind, they very well might have done it in house and, and gone forward with that. They wouldn't have spent all the money that they do uh, spend on us. So I think that is key to understanding that the clients who come to us expect that level of integrity and that evidence-based um, recommendations and outputs from us. Thank you. Uh, Doobie, slightly different question. Um, so I guess, 
people have seen may have seen what trading floors look like you know on tv or you know heard from friends what 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 is it like these days working working as a trader what give us give us give us a, a glimpse of what it's like so first and foremost if any of you see have seen wolf of wall street get that out of your head right now it's not like that um but it is still quite dynamic and it's quite like interactive um every single day is obviously quite different and you'll find a lot of the time people from different teams are trying to um you know find new and unique ways to kind of collaborate and work with one another and and so you do still get a lot of that you know shouting screaming hey have you got this hey have i got this kind of thing going on um i think in the past you know I've only been there for two years, but in the past few months and then, you know, during the periods where we had uh, new lockdowns come in, you would see that the activity on the floor was a lot more. Um, you know, people were obviously trying to solve, um, you know, new and immediate um issues and situations that were presented in front of them um, which again just required a lot more collaboration um, so I think the trading floor is definitely one where you know you get to you get to uh, see so many different a di a, such a diverse um, set of people working on for so many you know different clients trying to solve so many different issues but doing so in a way that is still you know very collaborative towards a common goal that the firm and the um, you know, department as a whole has as well. So yeah, it's pretty, pretty interesting. Nice. Okay. So, and just to end, I guess we would, let's do one minute. What top tip to, I guess, 16 year old um, right now. So everybody, one minute top tip. Let's kick off with Grace. Um, I'd say in, if you're if you love economics, just immerse yourself in it. So read, I think the public sector people said this, read the Economist, the Financial Times, um, get to, if you go to uni, get involved in the societies. It's an excellent way of um, building up your networks and just having fun and meeting friends um, and just enjoying it. It's, I, I, obviously, we all love economics, but just enjoy the subject if you can. So um, don't, you know, don't think of it too much as a, a qualification. Look into it. Look what try and find what you like about it and explore it further. Super, thank you. Fiona? I would say my top tip is just know that nothing is off limits to you. Everything, everything is within your reach and you've got such an exciting path ahead of you um, and, uh, and go for it. Just absolutely go for it. Just, just believe that you can and explore it. And if it interests you, ask questions. Uh, it, it's a cliche, but I, th I certainly think it's true that there are no stupid questions. I think it's show initiative uh, and put your hand up um, and, and, you know, really just, just give it a go uh, and find out, as, as Grace said, what you like, what you're interested in and follow that path. Do the thing that you love the most um, and, and don't limit yourself. Just absolutely you go for it nothing is nothing is off limits um, and have fun with it along the way thank you fiona and georgia yeah just really echoing what's been said i think um one of the something that's really important is getting experience where you can in the sense that you know you don't really know what something's going to be like until you actually do it so getting experience where possible um, if you're interested in something then you know reaching out to people on linkedin or sending them an email sometimes you know companies will give email details of um of of their workers and just asking a bit more about you know what do you do like how do you find how do you find your job what sort of skills do you need um and you know more often than not, people are really willing to have a conversation. And so, yeah, I just encourage you to, to reach out and get as much experience as possible. Thanks, Georgia. Priyanka? Yeah, I think just to add to whatever been said, I think one key thing is to remember to not let uh, stereotypes define what economists do. And I think events like this definitely help break that break that down for people so please do attend more of these events and research and I think if you if I had to go back in time I think this was a question asked um, to the previous panel but I I was thinking when I, I heard that question and I really wish I had all the resources available back then um, be it YouTube videos online courses reading reading materials podcasts anything uh, to give you a taste of of what you can expect and then decide um, instead of going uh, by mainstream views. Uh, and I think there was uh, something in the chat about work experience and internships. I think they are excellent avenues. 
uh, for students to find out uh, in real life what it means and and if the opportunity comes by i would highly encourage people to experience that thank you Priyanka. and finally Juby. yeah top tip from me would just be don't hit don't uh, don't underestimate how kind of broad and and how much and how diverse economics can be um so you know obviously i work in a financial role my my focus when i'm looking at economics for my job day to day is from more you know a financial or monetary policy perspective but a lot of people what a lot of people don't know about me is i also have a very deep interest in development economics as well um based on my studies and i've been able to use my understanding from that to kind of um you know start create and now grow a social enterprise focusing on you know helping uh young people with their careers here in the UK. I wouldn't have been able to do that had it not been for um, you know, some of the teachings and understandings that I got from studying development economics during my time in university. So you'd be surprised like the number of different uh, fields and areas that economics can branch into. We've already spoken about health, now there's development, there's behavioral, there's obviously more financial focus. Um, and, and each one can just provide you with the tools to do a lot of different things um, that a lot of people don't necessarily think of when they first think of economics. Super. Thank you very much for your time, guys. Very lovely panel. And if you're still, if you're still around, please stay. Um, if you have to go, please, you know, drop your LinkedIn for people to, to connect with you if possible. Um, but thank you very much, guys. Uh, so I would say with the next panel, please stand up. But you know, now in the online world, I would say next panel, please turn on your cameras. Um, so I think we've got Rebecca, Carmen, and Adam. So we'll kick off with introductions. So please just, you know, tell us what you do, um, what you enjoy about your, your, your line of work. Let's start off with Carmen. Hi everyone, it's great um, being here. Thanks a lot for having me. Um, I'm a PhD student in economics at the University of Warwick a researcher at the London School of Economics, and I'm also an analyst at the London Metropolitan Police. So what I do is applied microeconomics and very much in the line of um, what our colleagues in the private sector discussed, I look at data and I apply economic thinking to different problems. So in particular, what I study is crime and my work involves either writing long academic papers. So questions in which we really dig deep and spend a lot of time thinking about, for example, um, what is the impact of inequality on crime? What are the determinants of domestic abuse? How uh, does the police response? Is the police um, discriminating in any aspects of their response? And this type of really big, really exciting questions. So what I like the most about my job is I get to really work with the police. Sometimes it's, as I was saying, these academic papers that are, uh, complicated, complex, and very long. Other times it's policy projects that where the police just really needs a different input. And that's really the interesting thing about economics. Is you're, if you choose to study economics, you're going to learn uh, to think outside the box, to think of a problem from many different angles. Uh, what are the incentives of these people? What are the incentives of this other population uh, or firm or country? So that's very exciting. Um, I just wanted yeah, to, to mention that I didn't always like the economics. So it's also okay to, to you know, not be sure about what you want to do. The most important thing I think is to keep an open mind. Uh, every field is interesting and the more you learn about something, the more interesting it becomes. So I think that's something important when you're choosing a degree. Thank you very much. Uh, Rebecca. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm a senior economist at the Joseph Roundtree Foundation. Um, we are a charity with a kind of overall mission to um, end poverty in the UK. Um, and within the charity, we have an economics team, which I'm part of. Um, and I guess our goal is to try and do research that understands uh, why poverty persists, what factors um, increase poverty in the UK, um, and to then also work on the policy side. So we do uh, quite a lot of research and thinking around what economic policies could be put in place so that 
uh, the lives of those with lower incomes are better um, and also too kind uh, to try and reduce poverty in the UK. Um, so in terms of what that means for my job, there's probably that those two parts. So the first research part is a lot of data analysis um, that me and, and people in my team do. So we take, for example, data on, let's say, the labour market, the world of work, wages, incomes, um, and try and understand why some jobs are low paid, um, try and understand what's going on there and why there are inequalities in say incomes between families. So lots of kind of data analysis. Um, I myself um, do less data analysis these days. Um, I've got colleagues who are much better at that than me. Um, so there's quite a variety within our team. So most of my time is usually spent kind of looking at findings of analysis and um, writing about them and uh, drawing conclusions or writing arguments. So, so saying like the government should do X or should do Y based on our findings. Um, so that's a bit about my role. Um, in terms of what I enjoy, I think one of the things I really enjoy is the variety of the job. Um, so as I said, some of the time I'm writing, reading, sometimes I do data analysis, other times I'm talking to people outside the organization about our work. So maybe in government, or politicians um, and we also have to talk to journalists to make sure that our findings are shared in the news um, and that the news is kind of credible in terms of what it's talking about and the data it uses so there's lots of different things to do uh, and that means that um, because I enjoy those different elements it just makes it quite varied and quite fun um, and there's a lot of different tasks to do each day um, and also I think the other thing is working for a charity um uh which is also sometimes called a think tank uh it's there's quite a lot of freedom in terms of what you research so we're lucky we have we have a lot of funding as a charity and that means that we can kind of sit down each each month or each couple of months and say what what do we think is important for us to research and then kind of go off and do that which is which is a very kind of it is a luxury you won't always have if you're say uh in the private sector or you've got specific clients you need to work for um so yeah Nice, thank you, Rebecca. And finally, Adam. Hi, um, everyone. It's uh, good to be here. So my name is Adam McGeoc, and I work at the Fraser Valentin Institute in Glasgow. So um, the institute here is an economic research institute. Um, we're based in the economics department at Strathclyde Uni. So we carry out a range of commissioned research for the public, private and third sector. So while we're based in the uni, we definitely benefit from the economics department. However, we're quite different from academia because we essentially produce a lot of commissioned research and um, consultancy reports, um, which is quite different, which is what I'll realize when you go to uni, uh, from kind of typical academic research, um, which is one of the reasons why I like working here. Um, so what I do specifically, I specialize in business analysis and, um, and business engagement. So I work on our quarterly um, business survey our economic commentary as well, which is every quarter. And most of the time I carry out economic, societal and environmental impact assessments for um, a range of our partner institutions. Um, so that can be for specific businesses or for industries as a whole. Um, one thing to note though as well, that's something that I specialize in. There's people here um, who specialize in child poverty, people that have worked in, in places like the GRF prior to, to coming here. Those people who specialise in energy economics, um, in economic modelling, um, in fiscal policy. So there's a real mix of economists here who each who kind of have their own lane, which is which is really great. Um, and what I enjoy, um, I think mostly engaging with businesses. So quite a lot of the time, you know, data can tell you one thing, but it is just data until you actually speak to your partners and speak to businesses and find out, you know, the kind of challenges, opportunities they're facing. And um, you don't really get that well-rounded picture of what's going on. Um, and, and like Rebecca said, you know, kind of the extra bits to, you know, once you produce a report, you know, speaking at events and being involved in roundtable discussions, these kind of things are, are really fun. Um, they're definitely nerve wracking the first time we do them um, and still are, to be honest, but there, it's really fun to just meet people uh, in your field and people that are interested in your research, so. Thank you, Adam. Uh, so Carmen, we have a question from Sophie, which I'm, I'm gonna pick up. Uh, she says, I mean, your role, your job sounds interesting to anyone. Um, 
working with working with the police. I guess so. She's asking basically how you ended up in your role, like your route to, to getting there. And I guess also I'll stick with you for the second question because um, I've seen some questions about coding as well. So just if you could talk a bit about, I guess maybe if you or some of your other PhD colleagues in terms of how much um, coding is being used. Because I know in, in, in our department in Bristol, like people are using R, you know, Python, etc., cetera, in, in, in their work. So just a bit about, I guess, I guess how you got to, to where you are and also the use of coding in economics. Great, thank you. I also saw uh, a question, someone is mentioning they wanted to study international relations. So I'm actually gonna tell you my story because it's kind of fun. I also wanted to study international relations, uh, but then back then I was advised by my father who found out about international business and economics. Uh, and back then in Spain, I studied in Barcelona. It was the only degree taught entirely in English. So the word international there confused me and I studied that instead. When I applied to a master's later on, I applied to the College of Europe in Bruges because I was interested in the institutions and so on. And my first option was international relations. My second option was uh, Euro European law and economic analysis. So I didn't get accepted to international relations, second attempt um, at studying that, but I got offered a scholarship to study economics. So in a way it's kind of economics has chosen me and it wasn't until I joined as a research assistant at the LSE where I discovered all of a sudden how fascinating it could be, uh, you know, applying coding, applying economic thinking, applying data analysis to very, very real problems. So I guess, of course, don't study something you don't like, but uh, keep, again, keep an open mind in whatever you're learning because you never know. <laughs> I think that's part of the message. Something else I was reading in the chat is there's a lot of questions about math uh, also related to coding. I think there's a wrong conception of maths and coding as abilities that we are somehow born with and you either have or you don't. And that's not true at all. There's definitely people who have, for whom it's easier, definitely. Um, I wasn't one of those people. For me, mathematics is difficult and it requires effort. But the, the key or something that I've discovered is that it, it is possible to learn and it is possible to become better at maths. So don't be intimidated by these big words. Um, it's a challenge and very often we set our own boundaries. So the first thing is believing that you can become better at math. And I can assure you it is possible. Uh, I'm a living proof that that is possible. Uh, so I'm hoping that answers your, your question. I use coding all the time. I used to, again, think this is not an ability I could have. I personally use data and a bit of Python. It's uh, like anything else, like, like a sport or, you know, any other ability uh, practice is makes perfect. So persistence and uh, believing in yourself, as uh, Fiona was mentioning before, is key. Yeah, thanks, Carmen. I, I, I'm the same. I, I'm also one of those who struggled with maths. And, you know, I, I really had to like after school, like, you know, still keep trying and trying and trying before, you know, I got to a place where I'm a bit more comfortable. But even now in math class, I'm like, oh, my God, what's going on? But, you know, it, it like, like, like Carmen said, it, don't let that be the, the barrier per se. Um, but even even with that, if you don't love maths and you still want to study economics, that route is also there. I know there are many universities that offer like a BA in economics, which doesn't require maths at A level, for example. So, you know, both routes are, 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 are there. Um, so the options are, are available. Thank you very much, Carmen. Um, I guess to Rebecca and Adam, in terms of, of research, how, how have you guys found, or have you found it difficult, or how do you guys find doing this complicate, well, complicated research on one hand, and trying to get impact, you know, to to the you know to the uh, to the government or like you met, Rebecca, you mentioned the news. How do you find you know that? Is it a tussle or how do you find the dynamic between doing complex work or doing you know very detailed research and being able to communicate that to to have as much impact as possible, you know, you know on, on the ground. That's a great question. Um, probably for me, the, the, the main answer from my experience has been being part of 
an organization with lots of other teams and specialisms. So we have an economics team, of course, but we also have a media team, we have a campaigning team, we have a marketing team, a comms team, and you only really achieve uh, impact and influence when you put that all together. So I have learned so much from my uh, colleagues in the other teams over the last five to six years working in this kind of world and um they very they're very much i think some people have this view that we go away we do the research we write something then we give it to a media team or we give it to a campaigns team and then they turn it into something useful and give it to politicians or something but that's not really how it works we start all together at the beginning and we say what do we want to influence on in order to achieve that impact or in order to make the news, what should we produce? So they're all kind of, all those questions are tied in from the start. Um, and for me, that's been great because it's meant that I've learned a lot more about politics that I never knew before. Um, I've learned so much about how to communicate in terms of and how to speak to journalists or how to write stuff that might um, have an impact with say a minister. So um, yeah, not, not really, all to do with the researchers it's it's a kind of organization wide thing for us at least uh, and all those different skills are so important in terms of you getting that impact from the research thanks rebecca i like how you explained that and adam so definitely agree with everything rebecca said and um something that we always try and do is you know economics can be really complicated so if you can simplify um, what you're trying to say as much as possible um, and this is something when people leave university and maybe join us you know they kind of want to sound as, as smart as they can be and they complicate what they're saying but actually um, you know if, you, if you're wanting to have an impact um, you know you never really read a news article about an economics issue and it's got a lot of economics jargon um, you know you have to explain it in, in terms that someone who's a an economist how you know they'll understand it um but it's not just about that and it's not just about the report it's about the additional output that you produce so um whether that's recording a podcast after after uh, publishing a report and inviting um, relevant stakeholders on to talk about the findings and a bit more about it and um, we have an article site where we publish about a summary for people that don't want to read the full report um, and then there's also things like actually producing you know press releases dealing with the press and making sure that you you pick out the key points that you think will you know um best to try and convey to, to different news outlets um, and again as I said before um, speaking at different events roundtable discussions just continuing the conversation um, it's always these additional outputs that that's what gets you your, your impact if you just publish the report on your site and don't do anything else um, you know not many people will pick it up you need to there's still a lot of work to do once you finish the report. Super I'm, I'm loving the diversity of I guess what an economist does um in, in the in the everyday roles here um great i guess to end let's do a 30 second you guys have less time than the others sorry 30 second um top tip uh adam you can you can start us off i think uh, this was something that grace had maybe touched on um, when she was talking in, in the last session um a, a top tip i would have is definitely enjoy university i was very focused um both in my undergrad and my master's uh, on grades I just wanted to get it over with I wanted to you know to get the best grade possible and so I didn't really join really any societies or anything like that I was just always in the library studying um, so I think I, if I could go back I would have maybe enjoyed it a bit more and and, and I think um, yeah just it doesn't need to always be about the, the result you get from an essay and an exam you can actually enjoy you know because then when you work you know things are very different you, you realize that Uni was uh, an easy ride in a way. Yeah, definitely good advice. Enjoy it. Work hard, play hard. <laughs> uh, Rebecca? Um, can't really add too much to, to that and the others as well. But um, I suppose one, one reflection I've had is, is, is that there are so many different jobs out there. And also, it's, it, it, I mean, depending on where you, what you'd want to do, there are so many different routes between them. So I'd um perhaps a tip would be don't worry too much about landing your perfect job or your perfect career initially like find something do do your research think about what there is find something you are excited about and go for it but you know if you hate it you can move to another job if you if you you might find after a few years you want to do something slightly different and then you can move you know what i mean there's lots of different um 
roots around and I think a lot of people worry so much about that first one being perfect or finding that perfect option um, and yeah maybe just a tip on you know don't worry too much about that. Thank you Rebecca and um, Carmen. I fully agree with that advice Rebecca and Adam. I would just add one last thing um, I used to really think much less of myself so whenever I was applying to universities or to masters or to whatever or to companies my first thought would be, well, this top company or top university or whatever would never take me, right? Why, why would that take me? So um, don't do that to yourself. Uh, aim as high as you can, as far as you can, and follow, follow your dream. Very well said. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you, Rebecca and Adam, super panel. Thank you very much, guys. Okay, let's move to the final panel. And we have Shruti. I just need to check that you're still here. Okay, there you are. Hi. Love Hi. It's just you here, it's just you and me. Um, but okay. yeah, let's, let's go for it. <laughs> okay, um, yeah. Introducing yourself and tell us what you do and what you enjoy about your role. Cool. Um, First of all, this is so exciting to be here, seeing everybody talking about the different roles of economics. I wish I had this when I was like 18 years ago when I was making that decision, because um, I had no idea. And I did not do economics to start off with. And my journey into economics is quite complicated. And, and my current role is also kind of, it's been quite a journey of trying a lot of different things. So um, really fantastic points brought up by Rebecca and Carmen in the previous previous session. Uh, so just a um, little about what I'm doing right now. And you know, I'm representing the tech sector here. So I work as an economist at Amazon um, UK, and I have been doing this role for the last a little over a year. Uh, before that, I was an assistant professor. So in academia for five and a half years, at the Toulouse School of Economics. Um, so I have, uh, in terms of my educational background, I, I was in India. I did an undergrad in mathematics, which a lot of people have had questions about maths, et cetera. I have a lot to unpack there probably later on. Um, for several reasons, I kind of wanted to get away. I love math, but I wanted to get away from the abstractness of, of math. And I um, ended up thinking about economics because I thought it it really lies at the intersection of qualitative and quantitative studies, at the intersection of science and social science. So it's just like a really exciting, uh, exciting field. And I did my master's at the LSE, like a lot of the panelists as well. Um, and I actually dabbled in investment banking. I interned there. Um, as Rebecca said, didn't think that was a great fit for, my, for me. Um, I actually gravitated towards more studies and I went on to do a PhD in economics from Northwestern University in the US. And then I went into academia for five and a half years. Again, things were getting too abstract. And I think I kind of was again looking for something, uh, you know, a little bit more real, even though I love economics and I love math. Um, so then I, I got this opportunity at Amazon and, and that's, uh, that's where I've come. So totally uh, just sort of reiterating points made by Rebecca, like, you know, your first, I'm still, I'm still searching <laughs> for what is that great job. And I have to say, economics has just given me so much like leeway to explore. Like, you know, I have managed to every few years uh, be like, you know, actually maybe I want to try something new. And I find my skills always in demand. So, um, so that's a great, uh, great shout out there. So, so definitely a, a point that I wanted to touch upon. So more on to my role as an economist at Amazon. Uh, the way we see, so, you know, there's a whole position for economists in Amazon. And I think when people think about Amazon, they think about big corporates or they think about data scientists and machine learning engineers and software developers. But there is a, there is like a, a special a role for economists and um, they're different from data scientists and they're different from uh, the business team. And how I see my role is that economists are really the bridge between business and the science uh, in Amazon or in, in the tech sector. And to explain this sort of idea a bit more, 
it's more like you know the business team is going to have some big vision for like the year or for the next five years and they'll have some big vague abstract goal that they want to hit and um you know it's a in tech everything is data driven all decisions have to be based on data and uh you know and there's a whole lot of data scientists who are very good at crunching numbers and and, and producing results and graphs and, and and all that all that information and i think what the economists do is provide that conceptual framework and really like take that really complex problem as um uh, one of the panelists in the pre in the previous uh, session said you know economics can be very complicated but i think the way i would put it is problems in the world are very complicated and what economics helps you do is is come with frameworks conceptual frameworks so that and gives you tools to really sim to break it down you know to to really simplify the problem to really sort of uh, frame what is the important piece of information that's going to answer this business question. What is that piece of information that the data scientists should be crunching so that it's going to answer that question? So really it is about, you know, it really does give you that conceptual, like that whole sort of ideation, thinking about the problem uh, from first principles, thinking about it from the point of view of, of uh, agents, you know, um, David, you initially said, you know, you think economics is about people. And I think what my job is to make the problem about the customer completely and think about and as some other panelists earlier said, uh, you know, it's about understanding the incentives of people and, you know, what drives the decision. So my job is to also un unlock that, right? Like what is how are our customers, you know, so the agents become the customers. It's like, how are the customers making decisions? What attracts them to Amazon or what pushes them away from Amazon? And so understanding that uh, becomes kind of part of the of the job. Um, I can talk more about it, uh, but let me talk about what I love about my role. I think what I like, what I've been really enjoying um, about this role, it's only been a year and a bit. I'm still learning. I'm still exploring. Uh, but uh, I think what I've really been enjoying about this is um, at Amazon, uh, the problems, like there is no, there's like not a lot of resource constraints, except for time, maybe, you know, you want to run an experiment to learn something, you want to run a survey to learn something, you want to use data to learn something, there is all that resources. And what you have to do is just think out of the box, like every day, there's a new shiny problem I go to, there's a new shiny problem. And I need to use all my economic skills to do some modeling to understand what the problem needs. And think about, you know, which part of the data, what kind of experiment, or what kind of survey is going to get to that, uh, which is going to get me to do an analysis, which will get to the heart of that question. So it's, I just find that intersection just incredible i just find it quite thrill i find it i just find it very enjoyable that you know um i can think out of the box and then i can see all my ideas sort of like right on the amazon website you know when the experiments go live uh so I, I just find that really exciting um there's a i mean i i've i've been doing economics for the last 15 years now through my studies phd academia you know amazon so i mean i clearly i'm a big fan of economics i'd recommend that to anyone <laughs> um and i'd also iterate on points you know um other people made like carmen on um you know like I, I think there's a lot made out that it's very difficult and the math you need math and you need um a lot of um you need a lot of like coding skills these are all handy these are all helpful skills to have but i think economics is really about finding the mental model and like a way of thinking you know it's like really just getting out of the box and thinking keeping an open mind being observant um and i think you know i think it's a very powerful thing like you can really do so much and i think that is what gives it this breadth of opportunities so yeah i think i've spoken i've rambled on for too long so we'll take questions no, from i was i was i was a i was an attendee at this point I, you, you did all, everything i, I was going to do <laughs> But thank you very much. I guess well, from from outside, for the economists in like academia, or, you know, outside of, of of a place like Amazon, I guess we see like a place, the tech industry as 
like, like there's there's so much data there that we just like kind of like drool over and like oh god if only if only we had that because <laughs> that much data i mean like what's it like having 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 that and like is it ever is it ever over, overwhelming in terms of how to even like structure that and yeah. what's it like I yeah absolutely this the this is the opposite problem of academia i think when i was in academia i was like i don't have enough data i need access to the big data and now i'm here at amazon there's so much data that there's almost like paralysis in terms of like how to use so much data <laughs> so it is that that is an issue but having said that you know you you pull back you you bring your skills as an economist you break down your problem you simplify it you start with square one you you first go like you know you're not going to solve the entire puzzle at the same time you take you you break the problem into small pieces start with the basic piece find the data set for that which will not be like the whole data set of amazon <laughs> um and so so yeah so again like again thinking about the framework this is why frameworks become so important it's not just about running some numbers and running a machine learning algorithm but it's about thinking out of the box as to what is driving what is the what is the incentives of the customer or what is the incentives of the firm that is driving this business decision and you know to answer that what is the part of the puzzle that i need first what is the part i need second and then you build on that and i think that is an important skill of being an economist to be able to break your problem down into pieces and to simplify it and then to build it build on it you know so so yeah so that's i i would say it is overwhelming and i and i think what uh, what i found is that it's not just that the data is available <laughs> and you know like again you know i have i'm probably one of the older oldest people over here uh, but uh, you know i'm still learning i i joined amazon a year ago and i realized uh, i've done a lot of so there's been a lot of questions on coding for example so i use stata i use r i use some python for coding but you know i came and and when i was in academia this was sufficient along with some matlab but then i came into uh, amazon and i realized you need to know sql queries if you want to draw any kind of data set uh, and if you need to like you know have it at your fingertips so it's also been you know again learning um, you know sort of learning a new thing again which also excites me about actually trying different things because i feel like i'm learning all the time and and um, yeah so yeah also economics has evolved you know as i said i did I went to LSE back in 2007 that's a long time ago now and um I remember people used to use something called eViews nobody uses that again that's what I learned you know in my masters it's an outdated subject so the thing is that as you progress you just need to have you just need the ability to keep uh you know learning and evolving with what's current and so um so yeah like you know you just you know you just have to have an open mind and i think economics just keeps evolving and you know it's just every year there's like a new language that people new shiny language that people use there's a new branch to econometrics like machine learning now uh, so there's there's just so much you know like the, the the field itself is growing every year and expanding every year so yeah thank you very much ruti that was very well said i i enjoyed that i like i said i feel Everyone here is really lucky to have this kind of opportunity. Like, I wish I got this when I was a lot younger. And I'm, I'm yeah, really proud of you to Sam and the rest of the team for organizing this. So great. Thank you very much, Ruti. Thank um, you. We'll now be moving on to Anita to talk to uh, Anika, sorry, um, to talk to us about applying to, to university. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. <laughs> um, I'm Anika. I'm a senior lecturer in economics at the University of Bristol. Um, and I was asked to talk to you today about how to apply to university. Now, this is a tricky subject because it very much depends on exactly which part of the application process you're at. So I've tried to pick the three key stages and the key things to think about um, at each of them. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions you have in the chat as well. Okay, um, so let's start with um, what happens when you're still at school or college or whatever you are doing just before university, even if it's um, working. Um, and the first thing I would say is that you need to choose your subjects carefully. So most people will choose these sort of about around the age of 16, but it might be before or after that. And I think the really, really important thing to know is that A-level economics is not required to study economics at university. 
I didn't study A-level economics and I'm still here 10 years later, probably more than 10 years now. Um, um, so, you know, it, it's absolutely fine. The one thing to be aware of is that some courses do require maths. Um, there's no rule about which ones do and which don't. Um, so have a look around. Um, I would say if you have the opportunity to study maths at A-level, try to take it. Um, but if you don't, know that there's still quite a lot of choice good choices out there for you. Um, so just do a little bit of research. Um, another thing that often comes up, particularly with A-levels, and I know not everybody here may be doing A-levels, um, but quite often people have the opportunity to study, say, more than three A-levels, or three A-levels plus an EPQ, or three A-levels plus an AS level, and all these kinds of things. I think it's really important to remember that all UK universities will offer you uh, an offer based on your top three A-levels, if A-levels are the three that you, uh, the, what you're studying. Um, and not many of them will change that offer if you have a fourth subject of any description. Um, so I think sometimes there's a sort of urban myth out there that if you take the extra one, then universities will give you a lower offer or something like that. It's not always true and it's becoming rarer and rarer. So I would say if you're going to choose an extra subject, then do it because you love it. <laughs> do it because it's going to expand your mind and it's going to add, you know, extra things to, to what you do and who you, and, and what you know. Um, but don't necessarily just choose it just because you think a university is going to like it. Do your research into universities and see if it's actually going to help you in that sense, if that's what you're after. The other thing is do exactly what you're doing right now. <laughs> so take as many opportunities to discover more about economics as you can. Work experience is definitely not required to start university level economics. Um, I don't look for it in, in the university applications I look at. What I do look for is people who are aware of what economics is. Um, you know, do you understand this great subject that we're about to get into? And do you want to do great things with it? Um, so come to things like this and check out as many summer schools and after school programs as you can find. So big names to look at, things like Discovery Economics, the RES, the Royal Economic Society, Sutton Trust has a lot of um, summer opportunities available for people, but also all universities have to do some kind of outreach. So take a look at both the universities you're interested in going to, but also the universities that are very close to you because you can attend more of those and look for words on their websites like post 16 activity, outreach, year 12, school events, and you'll find lots on there. It's just that there isn't really a centralized database in the country. So you just have to put in a little bit of legwork to find out what's out there. But there's everything from sort of one off lectures to week long programs. So do explore. OK, what about when you're searching for a particular course? So uh, again, this is about doing your research. So I think it's important to know that most economics degrees actually have three common elements that you should find in pretty much every degree out there. And they're what we call microeconomics, macroeconomics, and econometrics. Sometimes they might be clumped together in the first year in something called principles or introductory economics, but you'll find all three elements in there. The way degrees are gonna differ is by the proportion of time they spend on each of those things and the different options that they have available. So when you're looking at degrees, um, and you're, if you're interested in particular options, then start looking for those beyond just the, the, the basics. Um, that being said, do it with caution, because universities, um, you know, they, they change which professors they have, will have different specialisms at different points in time, and they'll constantly update their curriculum to make it as relevant as it needs to be for the modern economist. Um, so just because you see, you know, a third year option when you're applying when you're 16 or 17 doesn't mean that that option is still going to be there when you get to your final year of your degree. So that's just a word of caution. Try not to pick a particular program just because there's that one thing you want to do four years from now. Um, if that really is the case, then make sure you go to their open day and speak to them about the likelihood of that still being offered. Then there's the BA or BSc question. Now, as a general rule of thumb, a BSc in economics will normally contain a bit more maths than a BA in economics, which might contain more essay writing, more policy report writing, um, but there's actually no hard and fast rule. Some UK universities are just really old. 
So if you look at somewhere like Oxford, for example, all their degrees are called BA, regardless of whether it's maths or English literature. If you go to the Scottish system, you'll find almost every degree is an MA, even though it's a bachelor's program. Um, and there are other universities in the country where the economics department is just in a faculty that only awards BAs or a faculty that only awards BSCs. So it's some guidance as to what might be in there, but really you need to go beyond the title and have a look at what's in there in terms of proportions of what you study. There's also other things out there. So you might get BSc Social Sciences, you might get BSc Econ, that's what mine is. Um, you might get BSocSci. And there's also some master's programs, integrated masters they're called. That's where you do, your four, you do a four year first degree and you graduate with the masters instead of the bachelors. Um, and that can be good if you're worried about postgraduate fees later on, because um, they come at the undergraduate fees level. Beyond that, universities do tend to differ in study abroad opportunities, professional experience opportunities, combinations with other subjects. So take a look around. There's a huge number of options out there and see what piques your interest. Um, I'd also say that bursary scholarships and contextual offers, these aren't harmonized across degree programs. They change a lot. So um, if you need to look for different levels of scholarships and things, then, then keep looking at the universities that you're interested in and see how they differ. Um, I eventually ended up choosing the university I went to based on the size of the scholarship they would offer. So, you know, I know that this is really important for some people um, and it can vary wildly by universities. So, so have a good look. OK, at some point, you'll probably get to a stage where you're visiting a university to see what it's like. And at that point, you want to ask the people there lots of questions to see what the staff are like, to see what motivates them, to see if it's going to be a learning style that suits you. And I think at this point, it's really, really, really important to remember that university isn't school or college, okay? University is a different learning experience. Um, and I think David can probably tell you that sometimes you're left to kind of solve those problems on your own and you're gonna get a lot out of that, but it's gonna be hard, um, at least to start with. Um, I say that because when you visit the university and you're asking good asking questions, try to ask good questions. So an example of a sort of weak question would be, how many contact hours do I get? Okay. Now, how many contact hours you get is important. You're paying for your degree. Um, but a much better question would be, how are you going to teach me? What time do I spend with the lecturers? What do you expect me to do out of class? And how do I do that? Because universities spend a long time thinking about what's the best way to communicate this material and make you proficient at it. And so there'll be, I think you'll, you'll get a much more informative answer about what the program's like if you ask, how are you going to teach me? And what does that look like? Than simply how many contact hours? Because there's so many different what forms contact hours could take. It could be lectures, it could be seminars, it could be office hours where you speak one-to-one, -one, it could be labs where you're doing lots of coding. It could be all sorts of things. So try to ask good questions that are like, why do you do this thing in your degree the way you do it? Because I think you'll get a better answer that tells you more. Also think about the options you might want after university. So an example of why I say this is some people know that they love coursework. Some people know that they hate coursework when they leave school. And one of the things I often get asked is, do I have to do a dissertation? Now, lots of degree programs don't make dissertations compulsory. That's a big project you do in your final year. Um, and others may, do make it compulsory. But I would strongly advise you that before you've left school, you shouldn't be deciding whether or not you are definitely going to do a dissertation or you're definitely not. There are all these skills you're going to learn in the first few years of your degree, and a dissertation is a great opportunity to put them into practice and have a real project you can take with you into the job market afterwards. Um, now, that may or may not be the right thing for you by the time you reach your final year of your degree, but it's worth keeping in mind. Um, and so try to think about, you know, what is it you want now? What might you want in the future? And what's going to help you get to that stage beyond university? So that's why I say be open minded. OK, the last thing, writing your application. This is often one of the scariest things to do, because suddenly you have to put your entire life, summarize it in, I don't know, a thousand words or so. It's scary. OK. Now, the good news is that not every university uses the personal statements. I don't use the personal statements to assess entry to my degrees. That doesn't mean that you should just not ignore it and not put any effort in. It's a really great opportunity for you to think about 
do I know enough about this thing to really want to study it for three years? Because if you can't write a few hundred words about it, it's maybe not the thing you want to commit to at this stage. So use it as an opportunity to think about your motivations. Some universities will use it, so it can still be important and you send the same application to all five programmes you apply to. Make sure you're honest and make sure you're accurate. When people aren't, it often stands out. Here's a really bad way to start your personal statement. Ever since I was three years old, I wanted to be an economist. Now, I don't know about you, but when I tell people I'm an economist, people still don't even really know what that is. And there's no way I knew what an economist was when I was three years old. There just isn't. So try to start it with a genuine uh, thing about why you want to study it, not just um, a phrase that you've maybe, I don't know, absorbed <laughs> from, the, for, from the world. Um, I will say that I've said this for many, many, many years. And then recently I met the chief economist at Spotify. And apparently this is how he started it. It said 10 years old, but he was cheating because his dad was an economist. So, so I think that's, that's an exception. But for most people, this is, this is not going to be true. And it's certainly not going to be true from three years old. Okay, um, busting a few university myths here. So the university admissions market is a market much like anything else. It's actually one I study as an economist. And it has demand and it has supply and these fluctuate throughout time. And this means the rules of how you should approach university applications can change a little bit each year. And for many, many years, I'd say maybe the last sort of five or so years before COVID, um, the demand for university was nowhere near the supply. So people going to university almost were able to dictate which universities they wanted to go to. There wasn't much risk in their firm or insurance choice. You could pretty much choose it. But I'm an economist, so I like data. So here's a little bit of data for you. This is the number of 18 year olds in the current population. Um, and these are the projections that the Office for National Statistics made. And you can see that the number of 18 year olds is rising. Okay. Now that puts pressure on university places and it makes the price of university <laughs> increase. Now it doesn't change the tuition fees, but it changes the entry grades that people have on average when they enter university. And this makes it more and more likely that you might need to use your insurance choice. So please don't treat your insurance choice lightly. Choose something that makes sense. Choose something that you might get into should you not meet the grades for your firm offer and choose somewhere you want to go, okay? Um, not everybody wants to think about their backup plan, um, but it will make your A-level results stay so much smoother. Um, and it's just about being practical. So do take the insurance choice seriously. My final piece of advice is get your application done early. Writing that personal statement can seem like such a huge task, right? As I say, it's often the first time any of us sort of get ourselves down on paper and try and think about who we are and where we want to go. But you don't want to overthink on it, partly because it's not used by all universities, um, and partly because there's so many other things you need to get into university, like your grades. So don't detract from your grades and stop attending classes and stop doing homework because you're trying to do uh, your personal statement. Wherever possible, try to get at least a draft of your personal statement done very early before your final year of school or as early as you can do it. Get it out of the way and focus on the other things that are going to help you progress. Um, you can always worry about, you know, exactly which programme you want to pick of the five afterwards at post offer events. You don't have to attend every open day there is. Um, so, yeah, just just try not to lose focus too much on, on all those other important things. It's not all about the personal statement. So, in summary, choose your subjects carefully. To do that, explore lots of opportunities like discovery economics. Do your research and where you want to go, but keep an open mind because you might not know exactly what it is you want in the future. To get there, apply early, don't panic, take it carefully, but ultimately finish school, study economics at university, graduate, and then ultimately change the world. That's how I like to think of it. And I'll pause there. Thank you very much, Annika. Um, do you mind, I don't know if you could, yeah, of course, you already put it up there. I was gonna say, some contact details in case people have any more questions as well would be lovely. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Okay. Um, thank you very much, everybody. I know we've gone over time slightly, but thank you for, for, for joining us today. I think we're going to drop a poll as well for people to please answer. There we go. Please engage in the poll before you leave. Thank you very much for coming. And don't forget to visit, you know, Discover Economics, um, our social, um, social media channels. I think on Twitter is Discover Econ, Instagram as well, Discover Econ. Um, the website is discovereconomics.co.uk and LinkedIn is also Discover Economics. So please engage with us on our social media and our website. But thank you very much guys for coming. I hope you've enjoyed today's event. I very much did. Um, I think we heard a very huge breath about what you can do as an economics um, career, you know, from working with the police to working with clients, working at Amazon, the NHS, you know, we had a, real, a, a very diverse range of, of discussions today and I very much enjoyed it. I hope you did too. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a good evening.